Good morning. So last night, uh, this recap is going to be um, a little more difficult because uh, 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 I've got to tell you, it's the most, it's the, it's the most, as my wife said, she could hear us from, she said, I haven't heard you laugh like that in a long time. So it was, uh, it was a great experience. Um, laughing, it was laughing in a good way. Uh, not that we were making a joke of the game. But just you could just tell we were all relaxed and happy and having a great time. And there was just it was just it was good. It was it was uh, it was wonderful. So. Um, so I was laughing loud enough. <laughs> My wife could hear us uh, hear me anyway. OK, so again, this is the Joth uh, campaigns. Uh, this is Todd's world. Uh, we've been doing this. Uh, this was the 28th session. Um, this was a cliffhanger session. Uh, we are investigating a uh, well. We are re we are kind of returning to an old tomb, um, because the young God. How do I how do I say this? Okay, so originally Trotter and two other characters in uh, were hired by Farmer Tam to investigate this tomb that was unearthed when a large tree fell over the mouth of this tomb. Uh, of course, we went in to do that. Uh, two of us died. Trotter survived and uh, absconded with all the treasure. Uh, buried us, uh, you know, and uh, went on about his life. Well, later, uh, uh, the youngest son, the 17-year-old boy of Farmer Tan, uh, came running into town and uh, expressed to the lot, in Trotter mostly, because Trotter knew the kid, uh, as the other two that would have met him were dead, uh, runs to Trotter and says, oh my God, uh, you guys have unearthed some evil that has murdered my father, my mother, my sister, and I'm all that's left and I need you guys to come back and investigate this. And so that was where David, Lauren, uh, Bombrick, John's character, the dwarf, David's character, Lauren, uh, my character, the cleric, Jocko, and Trotter mount up with this 17-year-old kid and we head back into this tomb with kid in tow uh, and this was this was session 27. And we uh, you can hear that recap. But anyway, we get to the location where the cliffhanger as this dwarf materializes to the uh, west. I think it's to the west of us in a four way passage that has these murals with, with gems, et cetera. And he he storms, he materializes axe in hand and uh, basically says he's going to kill us all for desecrating the tombs. And then uh, last night's session started uh, with a. Uh, a role for initiative as, as this dwarf is coming for us down the hall. And Jocko, because Jocko uh, is a cleric and uh, materializes to him means he's a wraith or a ghost or a, some kind of undead thing. So Jocko steps forward, brandishes his holy symbol and tries to turn it, banish it. Uh, and uh, well, it didn't work. And Jocko's head is uh, popped like a cork from the top of his shoulders and Jocko is dead. Uh, so within... 15 minutes of us sitting down to get going here, right? I mean, Jocko is dead. First shot, first, he rolls a fat number, then a fat damage, and boom, my choleric is out of play. Um, and I roll up another character on the fly as as Bombrick and Lauren and Trotter all do an about face and take off to get the heck out of there, right? They flee it. Uh, because we have this 17-year-old torchbearer slash, technically he was our employer. You know, he came back and said, help me clear out this thing. I roll up a character on the fly, as can be seen in session, and I uh, uh, I assume a rig's character. So I'm a 17 year old fighter, rolled him up on the fly, and I'm I grab and drag away, uh, uh, you know, as we're running away, I, I grab up the backpack and the armor and, and weapon, and I'm suiting up, kind of running down the hall. I'm getting this, and we pass through this electrified kind of magical barrier, fortunately, and we. Uh, uh, then this dwarf materializes, cutting us off. Uh, so this thing is clearly capable of teleportation type thing. Uh, Arig, of course, wants to avenge his family's death. So I immediately charge into combat with it as an angry 17-year-old kid who, who wants to avenge the death of his family. Um, Todd is using a sundering, uh, uh, the sundering rule, homebrew rule, thank God. And uh, he hits, he hits, or I would have had two characters dead in the first 20 minutes of play, uh, which would be close to rivaling um, our online record, I think. Uh, uh, as I've said a joke before, I think the first game I ever made, I ever ran for Ivan, he died. Uh, he had a character, he had two characters die in a uh, session of Iron Falcon. 
with Josh. It was Josh, Ivan, and I. And, and Ivan died, uh, had characters die in that, two characters die in that short two-hour session uh, in that. And then later he joined us in a basic fantasy game and he had he had three characters die. In a, so unfortunately, Ivan uh, seemed to always be, and it wasn't, I wasn't targeting, it was just the, the nature of the luck. But last night I thought, oh my, if he had not had Sundering Rules, this kid would have been probably killed again. I would have been on my third character in the first 20 minutes. Anyway, uh, David grabs the kid by the scruff of the neck and uh, we all escape out. It follows us to the doors and out. We're all thinking, oh my God, we can't get away from this thing. But as the sunlight, as it steps out of the of the protection of the uh, dungeon door into the sunlight, it regresses back and uh, confirms to our dwarf Bombrick in the lore that, oh, it's a guardian dwarf. It can't be in the sunlight. It can't be exposed to sunlight. So uh, we got a little information. So now we're, so we immediately start the idea that uh, A-Rig, of course, loves the idea. As Bombrick suggests, we dig it up. We expose the tomb to sunlight, uh, eradicating this thing. And uh, of course, A-Rig immediately says, yes, let's pool our riches. Let's get retainers and let's, let's dig up this tomb dungeon, exposing, uh, you know, digging up the ground, which would expose the, uh, you know, tearing the roof off this uh, joint, so to speak exposing the entire tomb and layer to sunlight which we've all agreed is the way to go however trotter reminds us that we have unsaid we have unfinished business elsewhere that we might want to do first and we all agree to go back to blackfish uh a rig of course uh in tow wearing uh wearing a dead man's armor and carrying a dead man's backpack with the other 500 valued gold piece gem of the four gems that we recovered uh, and uh, we go back and we uh, talk to some some proprietors. Uh, we uh, they purchase some equipment. Avery att attempts to negotiate this uh, uh, this magical gem that, when exposed to fire, will, will explode like a bomb. And uh, of course, he wants that, but he doesn't want to give up his gem for it in this situation. So we I attempt to negotiate one percent of all winnings or all treasure that we would we would get. Uh, with and I fail the charisma check badly. So she says no. I, you know, Tam, I, I'm sorry your family's dead, et cetera, et cetera. As, as Todd says, the Ingrid, the shop, the alchemist says, listen, I, you know, I'm sorry your family's dead and all. And, but I'm just, I, I can't, I can't make a deal for 1% of nothing, so to speak. Right. Um, we, uh, we gather up some equipment. I attempt to purchase chain mail, which I, we, we forgot is not available because there's not enough iron and steel works for the blacksmith to be creating or, uh, any kind of metal devices. Fortunately, I'm able to uh, get a shield, though, from David. David hands me a shield. So in, in between this, Trotter negotiates with David's character. Uh, Trotter Dell, uh, as Trotter, negotiates with Lauren, David's character, and says, listen, I have this armor, this beautiful armor, uh, chainmail armor and a sword that I that I took from that tomb. And um, I've seen I've seen how you uh, work. Uh, you know I pre I like I like I like the, I like the cut of your jib, so to speak. I would like to in in exchange for wearing this, having this chainmail armor and sword, um, you be my my bodyguard, be my my guardian, my bodyguard. And David has to think about it a little bit. And of course, I teased uh, Dell quite a bit in metagaming that Avery went. Wait a minute, that belongs to my family. It belongs to me. You stole that. But of course, Dave. Uh, you know uh, Dell. <laughs> Dell was like, dude, he wouldn't know. That kid wouldn't know I have all this, right? You know, kind of thing. So I was, I was kind of purposely kind of jiving Dell a little bit, metagaming. But obviously, A Rig would not know. Uh, not not only he would not have been privy to the conversation, but he would certainly would not know that Dell abs absconded with this treasure from from my property that I've now inherited. So my character, not only am I the seventeen year old kid, A Rig, but I technically have inherited this land, this tomb, and I have fifteen hundred silver pieces that Dell paid to my father when he when he got treasure out of the tomb. So I, I have, I have a little, I have a character that instantly has background, but the background quite literally came from the, the, the actual sessions we played. So I, in a way I inherit this torchbearer kid who's got these things. So of course uh, it's kind of, it's kind of cool, right? That I've got this character who's really a first level fighter, uh, but now owns property and has a little money in the bank and uh, wants to see us eradicate this tomb so I can get back to, you know, uh, and what are all the treasures that must lay there, right, for us to uh, to make me rich, you know, and share with my colleagues, so to speak. Okay, great. And we just had laugh after. I mean, it was great fun. It was so relaxed. 
which we are, we're always relaxed and having fun, but I just haven't laughed uh, that hard in a long time. And it's a combination of things, I'm sure. Um, anyway, uh, cause all of our gaming is relaxed and full of joy, but it was just out loud laughter. We, I don't know what it was. Uh, maybe I was just giddy with, uh, you know, giddy with something. I don't know what, um, Anyway, had a great time. Uh, so anyway, uh, we agree uh, to, to that we will uh, hire, we will retain laborers to help us excavate the tomb and expose it. But as Trotter points out, we have un uh, unfinished business we should take care of first. Uh, he makes this deal with David. David is now wearing chainmail armor. Beautiful. Uh, clearly, it's obvious this is higher. This is this is royalty. This is armor is of some kind of special. Um, and a, and a buckler that has the gold fox on it. And uh, David puts two and two together later and says, wait a minute, this gold fox thing, what's up with this gold fox thing? It's very cool. Great lore. I mean, Todd just has a great world. And Todd is really good at just dropping these nuggets that we start to put together as we play. Todd is uh, he's a master. I mean, Todd is six, you know, Todd has been doing this for a long time, right? But it's this mastery, driblets of, of details and information that we all start, if we're paying attention, we'll start putting together. So the lore comes to us naturally live and in context to that moment. It's not info dumps, right? They're not these info dumps where, you know, and uh, some stuff we have to elicit from him with intelligence checks or questions, but sometimes it's just subtle description. He'll describe that there's this golden fox on the, on the buckler. I missed it in session. I wasn't listening to that. And David later was, some, uh, the witch said something to him and David said, wait a minute, don't I have that on my shield? And he looks at his shield and, and right, we start to put these things together. It's just, it's just, it, it, it's, it's organic play. It is play to find out organic play. It is open world sandbox gaming at its best and it's a joy. And you couple that with basically basic D&D &D Moldvay, which is what we're playing. It's just called Old School Essentials. It's a remastered version of Moldvay, a basic expert. And it's, I couldn't ask for more, right? As a as a guy who that's my favorite favorite uh, you know game. It's the game I grew up with. Uh, of course, I, old school essentials modernizes it and brings it into a a clean, well organized set of rules. It's masterful. Point is, I'm I'm it's it's I mean I mean I'm I'm really I'm in the I'm in the sweet spot in this campaign. I get to be a player. I get to play my favorite uh, game. The game that I had the most experience with as a kid, the game that I uh, still revere, as I often talk about Moldvay and its impact on me. And then, of course, we're doing this open world sandbox in a world that Todd has fleshed out um, over over years. So uh, he, he is it's, he's a master of his own domain, so to speak. And uh, it's it's just fantastic. And of course, what can I say about playing with Dell and David and John and and Justin and uh, all the guys we play with on and off? It's fantastic. Okay, where was I at? Okay, so we finally get together. We we decide to head northeast uh, toward uh, Bridges, uh, bottom uh, uh, in the Hobbit. Uh, excuse me, the Halfling Town. So we they had unfinished business that Jocko and my current character had nothing to do with, and that that they had to escort a well witch to a a, a Halfling town so she could establish a. Uh, a teleport um and that teleport would allow travel but it'll it, it allows instant travel from from large city to cities that have so anywhere there's one of these teleports it allows people to travel with a for a fee and, and around the world but she's the uh, well which is the only ones that can establish and build these these portals okay so that was something that that trotter that's leftover residue from Lauren and Trotter session 26 or 25 or something. And, and so uh, we only have a certain amount of time in which we can deliver her to, uh, I can't name, I can't remember the name of the halfling city, Bridges, uh, Breaches, Bottoms, Bottoms, I can't remember. So anyway, so Trotter, of course, wants to get this done for his people because he's a halfling, right? Uh, and so we head northeast and it's over, it's a day's travel. And we, we, uh, we, uh, get to the final four hours or so as it's turning dark and we 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 stumble across an old burned out inn or something on the side of the road all that's left is the foundations and it's been burned uh there's an old sign hanging there that says night uh good night's rest and but night spelled k and 
and there's some connection to some lore that we've overheard uh, our, our Lauren, the well, witch tells us, I think the well, witch informs us that it's connected to some old, old lore about a knight with a sword that's that, that, that brought down a dragon. So we're like, okay, that's cool. Um, so I think the well, witch told us that I can't remember how we learned that, but anyway, we decided to camp there for the night. Uh, a rig, of course, but 17 has never finished this far in his life. He's exhausted. He's whining. He's crying about his feet hurting. He, you know, so they agree to camp there and a rig hits, hits the ground and goes out like a light. So he becomes the final watch and uh, Todd makes his roles, uh, his wandering monster roles, whatever. And on the final watch, a rigs up and um, he spots around the old busted up fireplaces. I'm looking around. I, I, I mean, I described how I get up and I, I'm, you know, I'm bored, right? It's sun hasn't come up yet. I've been woken up by David for my watch. And I said, well, I'm going to kick around some of this old ash and I'm going to walk over to any of the old fireplace any of the old stuff and i'm just looking around to see if i can find something well uh, uh as i do i spot i'm not surprised this creature is surprised but i spot something that vaguely looks like a dog-sized skeleton spider thing um and i describe how i very quietly pull up my shield and draw my mace above my head to try to kill it and uh again cliffhanger uh todd uh, closes the curtain on session number 28. So we're going to have yet another cliffhanger. We're about to be attacked by this thing. I'm not certain. I, th I think he said I might have seen out of the corner of my eye that there's another one. There might be two of these things, but I can't recall if that was just, uh, again, I was I was laughing so much and enjoying myself so much. I, I missed some stuff, right? Um, but so I had, I had Jocko die in the first 10 minutes of last night's session. There's a very good chance that A-Rig will be dead at the hands of this creature uh, at the beginning of, of, of session 29. So, you know, it is what it is. And we talked about this. I've talked about this at infinitum. I've shared this over the course. I've been on YouTube on and off. I've had a couple of different YouTube channels. You know, I used to have dark age of man and I used to talk a lot about old school gaming and OSR gaming and where I come from and what it's about. And, uh, and there's a certain level of, of lethality to it. The game itself is lethal. If you play it and just play it, by the sheer nature of the way the game's built, it's going to be dangerous. And I talked about this in my other video. DMs don't set out to kill you. The game is just lethal. But there's some there's there is this idea that that's the world we're in, and we and what we're doing is not trying to become heroes. We're we're you know we're adventuring, and it's a very dangerous thing. And I appreciate it, but I'm 52, and I'm not hung up on it being something else. If I want, if I want characters in a more narrative game that are somehow going to last. And they're more they're more durable, and they're they're bound to be more hyper competent, superhero esque. I'm going to play a different game. I don't expect D and D to be that. I I want it to be what it is. And ironically, I love everything I do. I really do. I run. run I love running what I do. I love playing in the games we do. But there is nothing like this for me. I mean, this is this is home for me. This is this is. You know, um, like I said, why I came back to role playing was Labyrinth Lord. Why? Because Labyrinth Lord looked a lot like the game I was running for my buddies when I first came back to role playing seriously 12, 13 years ago. And it is um, it is just wonderful to have a chance to experience it as a player as much as I have in in Todd's game. And I've also gone through some of the same player uh um growing pains that i now recognize i get why players had these complaints there was a period where i had some character fatigue i mean i had some death fatigue right i went through a little period there was like damn it would be nice to have this guy last more than two sessions so i could develop character so you, so i had a chance to actually experience what this has felt like for players for eons and some players are okay with it some players hate it some players have made their career making videos bitching about how what rubbish old D&D is and what rubbish mold made and all those things are and I I never agreed with that but I I can actually say I've gone through the gamut now I've gone through the frustration of you know uh I had an opportunity to felt what it felt like when Ivan would say make a d6 roll here and it wasn't it's like a foregone conclusion and I I just took it for granted that everything I did as a DM players liked and that players were okay with it and so I had a chance to experience that and I think it's so important um, guys love to give advice. You know, most YouTube channels are GMs, experts giving advice to players and GMs ad infinitum. Rarely do we see any YouTube channels from the player's perspective that isn't some whiny, gripey, you know, guy who wants to bitch about old school gaming. 
So it's really interesting too that I I, I have all the experience as a game master, DM, etc. I've got a lot more games under my belt now in both GMing and playing, but that I've also had really have had a chance to go through this gamut of what this feels like, right? And uh, because of that, uh, and some of it rules is written, I've been able to say, I can firmly as a GM say what I liked and what I didn't like about D&D, clearly. But as a player, I didn't know that I wouldn't, I, I wasn't certain I wouldn't like experience points as the measure to level up. I can say now wholeheartedly that Sword and Wizardry Continual Light gets the leveling system right. It simplifies it. It's administratively easy. And if you survive, you get to let, if you survive so many sessions, you get to level up. And if you survive then so many more sessions, you get to level up again. And it's so much easier to do. And it also is not about killing and collecting treasure or experience points. It's about surviving. And that's just incredibly, it's, it, 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 again, I've had a chance to see why all those things that I liked, I liked as a GM, but now I know what, how it feels as a player to be grinding against treasure and monsters to get experience points. And you never really feel like you're moving very far, right? And so, and I love the fact that we are, as a group, we're utterly flexible about how to sculpt this, how to hot rod this uh, live. So the campaign's going and there's been some changes we've had to make. And there's been changes Todd has decided to make because he, you know, he's sculpting this. And um, we, we're all going to play whatever Todd puts in front of us, really. But it's been cool to watch Todd kind of sculpt this a little bit and kind of say, hey, you know, let's do this. And I love that he's added Sundering. I love Sundering, right? I've always, when I'm not running a game, rules is written. I've used Sundering rules. And I really dig Sundering, being able to sacrifice your shield to save your life. Uh, I've even used Sundering where you could sacrifice your sword or you could sacrifice your helmet, something to stay alive. And it just, it, it, it doesn't make the game squishy. I mean, it doesn't make you squishy. It doesn't make you uh, invulnerable. It doesn't make you a hero. It just allows your characters who are low level on that final blow, death blow, to give up something valuable um, to sustain yourself one more round. And very often it will be one more round. I mean, there's a good chance uh, against the dwarf. I sundered my shield against the dwarf. And if David hadn't hauled me away and we hadn't successfully fleed, I would have probably died sometime against that dwarf. It clearly was too powerful for us. But again, I was role playing. I was playing not from a player saying, I want to just keep stay alive. I was role playing as a 17 year old kid who hired these guys to come in here and get rid of this thing that murdered my wife and family. So of course, when it rematerializes in front of us and cuts us off and I'm, I'm suited up, I finally have pulled up the leather armor. I got my shield and mace. And of course, it rematerializes. It makes sense that a rig would go running at it, screaming, you killed my family, right? So I do believe you don't have to role play that out, but I do believe it, it makes sense to very often take action as from the perspective of your player. And I've talked about this before. There are people who would say, yeah, but it's, you're playing a game in which you're trying not to die. And so I get that. And that's why you want to, you want to have opportunity to negotiate the danger. When he sundered my shield and David said, let's run and grab me by the scruff of the neck, Arig wasn't going to be stubborn about it at that point. He's like, holy shit. I saw it cut Jocko's head off. I saw it pop Jocko's head off like a cork and it sundered my shield in one shot. Arig at 17 learned a valuable lesson. Calm the hell down, get the hell out of here, stay alive. And I think that that's what I've talked before too about meaningful death. People have bitched that there's no meaningful death in an old school D&D. Well, it's, that's because you have to have a meaningful character. Death only has meaning when the characters are meaningful, when there's history, when there's interplay, when there's something that, that when there's some wake of story that we're going to mourn when somebody dies, right? Okay. And many of them are forgotten. Jocko, for the most part, will be a blip on our radar because he wasn't, he wasn't in sessions very long. But there'll be those moments where you go, oh, yeah, right. Who was that? Who was that cleric that... But it doesn't matter. Like life, we meet people passing. Sometimes they become a part of our life and, and they become a part of our story and they become something that we we have we have we have depth, we have baggage, we have history, we have legacy as friends and as coworkers, as family, whatever. And there's others that come and go. And, and Jocko came and went. We don't know who's gonna be the heroes of these tales, right? If there ever are, right? Great session though. And it's true. I was just, I was cracking up. It was great fun, but we weren't telling jokes. We weren't being goofy. We were in, we were just enjoying uh, being together and playing this amazing game. And I'm going to tell you this, uh, 
my preferences and my biases have always been there. And I've always attempted to not oppress them, but I've always attempted to be honest that I understand they're there and I know they're there and their biases that I believe exist, but I'm not even certain if that's true. And I can talk about the things that inspired me as a kid, but I'm not certain if that's true. I, I would try all these different OSRs and I would talk about how much I liked them and I would play them and I'd fall in love with a new game every few months and and I would enjoy all of these experiences. But there is no doubt, there is no doubt that OSE is in my DNA. I mean, it is literally burned into my DNA. And I mean, OSE, old school essentials, uh, as the modern version of basic expert mold vape, uh, d and and it's um, it's just further confirming every time uh, we experience uh, every time we experience um, this open world sandbox uh, world of Joth. And I, you know, I, I, I got to tell you, I love the idea that I could roll up a character in two minutes uh, and take on a rig. Um, I had to immediately think, who is a rig? Well, he's uh, I rolled up totally average nines, almost all the way down. He's a fighter. He's just a farmer kid who's who's now he's been. Talk about zero to hero. He went from torchbearer, the guys that he asked to come save his him from from this thing because his family's been murdered. To what would he do? Is he dons the jet the robe, the Jedi robe, and he gets the lightsaber from Obi Wan? He's hey, I could be a I could be a fighter, I could be a Jedi, and it's fun to have that happen in thirty seconds, in two minutes. There's a there's joy in that, and being able to roll up a character in two minutes. Um, you know, and play is so fun. Uh, it's, it's, it's not the dying and the, it's not the, it's not the funnel of DCC that, I, that I've ever thought. I mean, it's very cool. It's very neat. It's very niche. It's very, it's very, um, I don't say gimmicky. That's it's just not fair. The game is designed, the funnel is designed for a reason to weed out and, to, and to create in a way what we're doing over the course of sessions a backstory for who these characters are and how they got here and who they, who, who they saw die along the way. So I get it, but um, nothing can, can nothing can replace the experience of actually playing D and D. And I'm going to say OD and D because again, OD and D I played a handful of times uh, as an adult, never saw it as a kid. I had homes. I ran homes briefly. Uh, it totally incorrectly as it was way above my head in 78, 79. It wasn't until we got 81 red box. But I can say with 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 without a doubt, um, there's nothing that can compare to the actual experience of playing old, let's say old classic D and D, nineteen eighty one or eighty three or advanced D and D. If you're if you're a two O guy, wherever your origin started, most likely that will always be some comfort there, right? And if you do it a particular way with a particular a, a group of people. You may even re fall in love with it, right? There's people who say, "Oh, dude, I did that when I was a kid. I moved on from that." Awesome. I mean, that's the. I mean, the role playing's amazing, but wow, it's been fun, and um, I can't say enough about it. So uh, again, we have another cliffhanger call. Uh, my character literally rolling initiative against some uh, dog-sized skeleton spider-esque creature, and I have five hit points and an armor class of twelve uh, with a shield thirteen. So um, we'll see if A-Rig will survive this upcoming um, wandering monster at our campfire, right? I talked about campfires in the video yesterday. Uh, we're having it. We're at our campfire. We're at our stop. And um, I don't care if it's trope. I don't care if people say, dude, I've I, I been doing that. Mm -mm. That is why, that's why we, that's why we loved it as kids. That's why we grew up. That's why I still harken back. That's why I still look for it. That's why I still want it. I will never get tired of this ever in a million years when I get tired of this. That doesn't mean we don't want to hot rod, homebrew, and sculpt it a little bit, right? Adding sundering rules, right? Um, utilizing roll under mechanics on attribute challenges as opposed to, say, uh, saving rolls or as opposed to, say, reaction checks. You know, Todd could have called on a reaction check last night with the in, in, in the barter between uh, my character, Agrig, and in Ingar, the alchemist, when I said, I, I'll make you a deal. Let me have that. Let me have that bomb. It's like a ruby. It's like some kind of alchemist fire bomb uh, because I'm thinking we can use it on this dwarf. You know, we get down there. We, we, we like to sucker afloat and boom, blow this dwarf to hell and, you know, in a bat, you know, and, and, and maybe be done with this easier than, than digging it up. He could have said, make a reaction check because that's what I do. So in, in, in Moldve, reaction checks for me are, our negotiation, bluffing, intimidation checks. So I always use reaction checks and you modify it by the charisma attribute. 
So I, I thought he was going to ask for a reaction check. And he said, now nah, make a charisma check in below. Fine. Works great. That, that's the great thing about old D&D. &D. You can do all of those things and it works perfectly. Um, and uh, my odds were as good because I negotiated. I actually had better odds. I had better odds uh, uh, in the charisma below with a bonus than I would have had on the reaction table because I have a zero modifier in charisma. So I was okay with that call because it meant I had a better chance of convincing her. But then I rolled a 19 and all bets were off. Um, amazing. Great fun. And I want to thank the guys again, uh, uh, Todd, for, 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 you know, doing this. Uh, and, you know, again, um, um, it's not easy to be a DM and it's, you know, every other week makes it easier for guys to do this. And I want to say, I want to, I appreciate him continuing to uh, be a GM for us every other Wednesday. It's really cool. And of course, David, Dell, and John, what can I say? You know, we all have a great time. There's such great respect. There's such great camaraderie. And um, uh, you can tell we all, I think, like each other. I think we all have good laughs. I think we all appreciate what we're doing. And I don't think we take it for granted uh, at all, right? And that's true. I could say that of, of everybody I play with. Um, so I don't want to sound like I'm saying we aren't having that with another experience. Of course we are. But I mean, it's just, it was, uh, it was um, very, it felt very, it, like I said this morning, I wrote them this morning and I said, you know, guys, it felt like we've been playing together for 40 years. I mean, it just, it just feels so, we might have, we might all have just grown up together doing this stuff for 40 years. You know, it's, uh, it's really cool. So anyway, thanks a lot. Thanks for listening. Uh, that's a recap of uh, Old School Essentials, Joth Session 28. We are headed to uh, the Halfling Village, escorting a well witch who's going to create a, a, a temporal portal, a, a portal that allows people to travel between cities, and now they would get their own. Meanwhile, we have been uh, camping at an old ruin, and of course, what happens when you camp at an old ruin? You very often uh, run into trouble, and we have indeed, as the curtain closed, uh, we are in a uh, initiative, basically. So just, I just love saying that. Roll initiative. <laughs> it's, you know, you can't, listen, you can take the man out of the thing, but you can't take the thing out of the man. And this is, uh, this is my DNA, man. It's my, it's my legacy. Love it.